Hello everyone, good morning and good afternoon. My name is Achala Virasingha, the Director of Cultural Affairs at the Sri Lanka Foundation and the Director of Operations at the HLF Academy of Performing Arts. On behalf of the Sri Lanka Foundation, I'd like to welcome you all to the medical webinar on the ground facts and treatment. The Sri Lanka Foundation International has hosted over 10 medical and business webinars from the SLF Academy of Performing Arts to the community. We also have plenty more other programs and events lined up for you in the near future. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to the new school year open enrollment at SLF Academy of Performing Arts. The academy was performed by Dr. Walter Jaisin in 2015. The school achieved its accreditation from the Accreditation Commission for Schools, Western Association of Schools and Colleges, known as ACSWSC. The free dance and drum classes are taught, highly, taught by highly qualified and experienced staff. Open enrollment is scheduled for Sunday, February 6th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. online, please join us. We also have scheduled the Pimper Ceremony, the graduation ceremony of the senior dance class students. It's scheduled to Saturday, May 7th, 2022. Virtual Sri Lanka Day Expo and Parade in July, 2022. SLF Award Ceremony on Sunday, November 13th, 2022. We invite you to join us on all these upcoming events. Now, before we begin, let me go over the disclaimers. The webinar is designed to provide information that is not directed to or intended for distribution or use by any person. The information presented at this webinar is collected, incorporated in good faith and provided purely for the convenience of the viewers and for general purpose only. It should not be relied upon for any specific purpose and no representation or what is given for its accuracy. The webinar will continue further attempt to ensure that the information has been from reliable sources and the host is not responsible for any errors, decisions or omissions of the information. The hosting company will not be liable for any incurred due to the use of the information and material contained in this webinar. Now, let me hand over the medical platform to the host our Director of Operations, Project Director, Keshini Vijayagunu Adana, and the co-host, Chamod Amrasingha, our Media Director. Keshini, over to you. Thank you, Achala, for that very warm welcome. Unfortunately, your video was not on, <laughs> but that's okay. I think you were uh, experiencing some technical issues. <clears throat> I would like to start out my remarks by extending my sincere gratitude to the chairman of the Sri Lanka Foundation International, International Dr. Dr. Walter, Walter Jayasinghe, for, for his ongoing guidance ongoing. and his motivation for us to take the leadership to host these medical webinars to keep the global communities updated and informed. We have been committed to educate, educate and bring, and bring, bring awareness, awareness consistently, consistently, which is one, of the, one goals of the goals in the five pillars that was established by, doc, by Dr. Walter, sorry, Dr. Dishan Jayasinghe, uh, the president of the Sri Lanka Foundation. Dishan, thank you so much for your ongoing support. My sincere thanks also goes to the vice president, Aisha Jayasinghe, for keeping us inspired and encouraged. Also, the daily immense support I received from our Chief Operating Officer, Shirani Sanislaus, the Director of Cultural Affairs and Academy of Performing Arts, Achala Veera Singha, the Chief Executive Officer, Rodney Pereira, but not last, but not least, the Media Director, Chamod Amarasinghe, who runs a complete technical program from behind the scene. Chamod, can you show your face to our audience, please? 
if you don't mind for a minute. Thank you, Chabot. I also want to take a quick note of thanks to Lal Talikaratna and the rest of the Academy of Performing Arts staff for their support as well. Professor Deepthi Jayasekara, the medical director of the Sri Lanka Foundation, who has also taken the leadership with me to organize every medical webinar the Sri Lanka Foundation has hosted. If I'm not wrong, I think this is the eighth medical webinar that we are hosting. And I'm very proud to say that. He tirelessly works in the hospital, but Dr. Deeply takes the time to also serve the community. Thank you, thank you. We greatly appreciate your support. Professor Dushanta Jayavira, another amazing doctor who has worked closely with Dr. Deepthi and the Sri Lanka Foundation to present very valuable information to our communities. We greatly appreciate your contribution, Dr. Dushanta. Dr. Dinesh Lianage, the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, North America, Western Region, we are so pleased to have you join us. And also thank you for your support. Without further delay, I'm very honored to invite Dr. Walter Jayasinghe, the chairman of the Sri Lanka Foundation to address the audience. Over to you, Dr. Walter. Dr. Walter. Well, could you hear me? Did yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a great privilege to have the two doctors you just mentioned who are super specialists on treating the disease. These are doctors who are seeing patients daily and seeing the complications and seeing the, the problem we are going through. So they are the best suited to give this seminar and we welcome them both for their support and for their time. Nobody's paid for all these, these all voluntary time and it's the greatest help you have done to the community in coming forward and giving your time. I don't want to waste any time. I welcome everybody to uh, learn what they can from this most uh, I would say most disturbing virus that keeps on changing its uh, image and giving us further and further problems. So let us welcome uh, the doctors and also uh, the uh, group that is listening in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Walter. Chamod, why are the, the videos video start coming on? Coming on? Now, I'm very honored to invite Dr. Dishan Jai Singh, uh, the president of the Sri Lanka Foundation International. Over to you, Dishan. Thank you, Keshini. Um, I just wanted to add to what Dr. Jay said. Um, very, very pleased that we have this group of professionals that actually um, can help everyone understand this disease better and to keep ourselves safe. Everything that we try to do in our day to day lives, we're, we're trying to get back to a normal. And I think uh, these doctors will help us understand how that could be possibly be and what we can do to safeguard our health uh, for the foreseeable future. I'm glad that everyone joined us and um, hope to do, I uh, hope you listen up very well and then we have a, a better life because um, of this. So thank you very much. And um, I'll give it back to you, Keshi. Thank you, Dr. Dishan Jai Singer. Our next speaker is the Honorable Consul General Dr. Lalit Chandradasa. Over to you, Dr. Lalit. Make Thank sure you, you turn your video on, please. Thank you. Thank you, Keshani. We, uh, you know, I think it's very timely that we are talking about uh, Omicron because I myself went down with it and I had to stay at home for 14 days and my I had to close my office. But the situation is not that... I mean, there are certain questions coming up even in America. Will we have a worse uh, strain coming up? Or will, with Omicron, as some say, will it be the end of the uh, pandemic? Because will we have uh, uh, herd immunity coming up with this? Because almost everyone is going down with Omicron. But the situation is very much... Uh, uh, worse in Sri Lanka because nobody knows what is happening. The number of cases which were down to around 500 average now has come up to 
new cases now has come up to 1,000. It touched 1,000 yesterday. And uh, unfortunately, the number of deaths also seems to be climbing up uh, uh, from average of 12. Now it has reached about 20 over a week. So these are questions. And of course, in Sri Lanka, people have now uh, got the idea that this is just another uh, cold and we don't have to uh, worry too much about it. And there is very little uh, uh, isolation. Though the government wants it to happen, people don't do it. So I think this webinar will at least uh, give us some direction as to what we should do, especially in Sri Lanka. Here, I think uh, people are getting uh, uh, the necessary information. And also, now, if you have had not had the booster, when should you have it if you have had uh, uh, Omicron? So these are the questions I think that will come up. So thank you very much, the foundation and Dr. Okay. Walter for organizing these things so that we will, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, we will be much more educated and we will know how to react to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lale. Now I invite Mr. Rodney Pereira, the Chief Executive Officer of the Sri Lanka Foundation International. Over to you, Rodney. Thank you. Uh, I born. Uh, I'm honored to recognize the distinguished panelists, uh, the regulars, uh, Medical Director Dr. Deep Jayasekara and Dr. Dushanta Jayavira, uh, and the moderator joining the Sri Lanka Foundation uh, Medical Webinar Series for the first time, I believe, Dr. Dinesh Lianage, President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association of uh, North America, uh, Western Region. Uh, permit me to flag some interesting points uh, as a non-medical professional. Uh, we have all had this dream since uh, March 2020. That is like the calendar references in ancient times go back to life BC before COVID. Uh, then as there was some hope to life AD after Delta. But now we are craving for a period, uh, some call it uh, OMG, uh, Omicron gone. Uh, it is yet fascinating that with all the mask mandates and other protocols, there are large scale events like in the sports world going on with thousands of persons uh, mingling freely. Uh, so it appears the message is, well, if you're vaccinated, then go ahead and enjoy. Yet we hear many persons who even got the boosters uh, catching Omicron and falling ill. Uh, we read that uh, researchers have found that Omicron has high environmental stability in that the variant can last uh, eight days on plastic surfaces compared to Delta, which lasts for less than five days. On skin, uh, Omicron appears to last for 21 hours. Then we are seeing new stealth subvariants named BA1 and BA2 evolving. Uh, also a common phrase we hear with regard to testing is uh, false negative or false positive. Uh, how do we overcome this? Is PCR the best tool over rapid antigen or at home testing? Uh, then also are persons with the regular plus booster shots experiencing flu-like symptoms because they didn't get the flu shot. Um, in many countries, vaccinations, which are generously available, may have reached a possible pinnacle. Now, does it mean that the 20 to 30% or more of the population in countries uh, that are not immunized will be a playing field for the virus where it will bounce around and then evolve into another variant, possibly one that may get around the known vaccines? Uh, then do people have to receive the new Omicron vaccine that is currently undergoing clinical trials? Uh, if that's the case, last time, although I said that our vaccine card has four lines, authorities may have to make a mini passport a version to keep track of uh, all the vaccines. Uh, nevertheless, there is some cautious optimism that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and let's hope that we don't exit one tunnel and enter another one. Uh, I appreciate the large numbers that continue to take part in activities of SLF, the brainchild of Dr. Walter Jaising and nurtured by Aisha and Dishan. Uh, you can spread the word and be involved in the ongoing enrollment for dance and drum lessons 
and the numerous projects, including COVID relief efforts, the SLF team is fully engaged in. Thank you all for joining and let us now benefit from the panel of medical experts. Thank you, Rodney. Now I invite the Chief Operating Officer, Shirani Stanislaus, to introduce Dr. Dinesh Elian again. Thank you, Keshini. Again, my name is Shirani Stanislaus, the Chief Operating Officer of Sri Lanka Foundation International USA. During the past year and a half, we have had several medical webinars, as Keshini already mentioned, uh, among various other webinars. Dr. Deepi Chayasekara and Dr. Dushanta Chayavira were distinguished speakers who educated the public and disseminated very valuable and in-depth information on COVID-19. Today, I have the honor to introduce yet another physician to you. She's Dr. Dineshi Lianage. Dr. Dineshi Lianage is a palliative medical medicine physician in private practice at community medical centers and St. Agnes Medical Center in Fresno. She attended medical college and completed a family medicine residency along with a palliative care fellowship at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She is currently the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at St. Agnes Medical Center and the president of Sri Lanka Medical Association, North America, Western Region. Over to you, Dr. Lian again. Thank you very much, Mrs. Stanislas, for the very, very kind introduction and a very splendid day to you all. It is a pleasure to be invited to moderate today's presentations, particularly in light of the clamoring demand. Clearly, there are so many, a plethora of questions that we need to address. My thanks to the Sri Lanka Foundation for hosting this event. Over the past few weeks, we have learned a great deal about the Omicron variant, and now we're learning more about its subvariant, BA2, and, and about COVID-19 in general. From the efficacy of natural infection to mount a robust immune response to the strengths and weaknesses of the vaccines and monoclonal antibodies, we certainly have much to cover indeed. Our first speaker today is Dr. Deepthi Jayasekara, who is very familiar to the regulars um, through these webinars. He will be speaking to us today on Omicron outpatient treatment guidelines. Dr. Jayasekara is an infectious disease specialist who serves as the chair of internal medicine at Emanate Health Hospitals, San Dimas, and Kindred Baldwin Park Hospitals. He is a clinical professor at Western and Turo University Medical Schools, and he works alongside administration in educating medical and nursing staff on vaccines for COVID-19. He has published in scientific journals and recently wrote newspaper articles for the San Gabriel Examiner on COVID-19. He volunteers his time at various organizations, including serving as the medical director of the Sri Lanka Foundation. And now without further ado, I give you Dr. Deepthi Jayasekara. Please, Dr. Jayasekara. Thank you, Dineshi. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to all the viewers uh, listening in, tuning in from all over the world. Thank you so much for the team, uh, including Keshini, Chamod, and Shirani, for, for organizing these events. These is, are this is really fulfilling um, events with, with enormous meaning uh, to, to me personally and to all the doctors. Uh, so let's uh, get to my slides. Uh, uh, let's see whether Chamot can start off uh, with the, the first slide. Yeah, there you go. And uh, so, so basically, this presentation was organized, uh, this webinar was organized with one focus, which is to, to share what we know, to educate our community 
about Omicron variant as well as other subvariants and then many more variants yet to come. But at the same time, uh, give our uh, kind of overall perception about this as to what to expect uh, so that the, the level of fear and the paranoia will be kind of minimized. So that's my focus, but at the same time, we will use some, some technical jargon. I'm sorry uh, uh, if you don't uh, understand because obviously as doctors, we do use those. So we'll try to clarify those things. Next slide. Uh, uh, so this is a mesmerizing schematic of, uh, of COVID-19 uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, depicting uh, the, the most important targets for the vaccines and the medications. So we're going to talk about mostly vaccines, medications, out of medications, there are oral and intravenous medications, and there are monoclonal antibodies. So spike protein is the main one, but we do uh, take uh, advantage of other proteins, such as M-protein and uh, nuclear capsid uh, protein as well. Next slide. Uh, next slide shows the breakdown of all the coronaviruses. Typically, uh, about 30% of common colds are caused by coronaviruses uh, every year, year in, year out, mostly common in, in, in uh, uh, autumn and uh, uh, winter times. Uh, there are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. There are four genera, genera of coronaviruses. Of course, the nasty ones, which are the zoonotic ones, which are originated from the animals or belong to beta ones. Uh, so this time around, um, I'm, I, I'm still experiencing a huge surge in my hospitals. I'm seeing basically hundreds of patients in my hospitals because of this fourth wave. But we do have our share of normal coronaviruses, the, the alphas and the betas that generally causes common cold. And to add to that, we have the Omicron variant in where, where most of the patients are coming down they're not coming to the hospital, but they are coming down with upper respiratory infections. But that's for people who have good immunity, for people who are vaccinated and boosted. But people who are vaccinated and boosted uh, with very poor immunity, like immunocompromised patients, that's not the story. People who are unvaccinated, that's entirely a different story. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so far, we've been unlucky to have had uh, so many variants due to mutations. Uh, this is basically survival of the fittest uh, with, the, with any virus, right? When they mutate, they mutate into different forms that will survive and, and, and fuse into the, uh, the, the main uh, you know, family of viruses. And that's what coronavirus COVID-19 is trying to do. Now they're trying to blend in to that family of respiratory viruses that make us sick every year, mostly during autumn uh, and winter, uh, and of course, some fall as well. Uh, alpha originated from, from UK, um, and that was in uh, like towards the end of 2020. And then beta and gamma, actually beta uh, originated from South Africa, and then gamma from, uh, which is also called P1 variant from uh, South America. But after those three, we were having a good time. But unfortunately, Delta hit us and, and we thought, yes, there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel, as Rodney mentioned. But sadly, it was a, a, a fast moving train, which was uh, the light at the end, the end of the tunnel. So we were completely overcome by uh, the other uh, variant now that been declared by WHO as a variant of concern, Omicron, right? Now, when you talk, next slide, please. When you talk about Omicron, there are three subvariants. We always identify three subvariants, which are called B1, which is the Omicron variant that we are experiencing. The B2, uh, BA2, BA1, BA2, and BA3. So BA2 is the feared one now, the, the one which is kind of emerging in other countries like Scandinavian countries, in, in, uh, in Nepal and some India, and then there are about 17 states in the United States we have we found. It's nothing new. We always expected this to come. This is supposed to be more contagious, but unfortunately, there have been some, uh, some growth advantage with the, uh, 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 the uh, BA2 because some tests don't detect that. So it could have uh, an impact on the uh, subclinical 
diagnosis, meaning people can carry it without the, their knowledge and can spread uh, around very easily. And there's another one called BA3. We'll talk about that later. So next slide, please. Uh, so the next slide shows how these mutations that become variants uh, are impacting uh, us. These mutations of any virus, uh, especially uh, when it comes to COVID-19, have the ability to spread faster in humans. That's the most important thing. The second one is it has the ability to evade detection by specific diagnostic tests, such as the BA2. Right, specific diagnosis. Now we know that, that all, all the PCR generally detect COVID-19 in general, but there are some weak PCRs by certain companies, which may or may not in the United States, may, may or may not pick, but we specifically use a, 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 a gene failure, a expression called gene failure of S1 to diagnose COVID-19 Omicron variant with certain PCRs like Thermo Fisher PCR. Uh, Thermo Fisher PCR can potentially uh, diagnose COVID-19. But in general, all these variants are picked up by tests, but it has the ability to evade detection by, by certain subvariants. And it decreases the susceptibility to therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies. That is the sad part. So scientists work very hard, tirelessly to come up with new strategies, new medications, and these viruses can mutate into forms that uh, that show reduce susceptibility to these therapeutics and the, but so far with antivirals we haven't had any problems oral pills we're going to talk about oral pills so oral pills have been pretty uh, sturdy and, and tenacious when it comes to when it comes to mutations so that's why the future of covid-19 is basically uh, i call it outpatient management the phase 2 of covid-19 is how do we manage this COVID-19 pandemic? We had to live our life. And for that, we need the oral pills, like the way we use Tamiflu for severe influenza, right? Like the way we use CMV medications, hepatitis B, hepatitis C medication, all those things. But mutations do have, do show susceptibility, reduce susceptibility to therapeutics, but we have been lucky so far with oral and antiviral pills. We haven't had that uh, uh, problem. The fourth uh, 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 point is ability to evade vaccine-induced immunity. We're going to talk a little bit about vaccines. There are, as you know, there are multiple, multiple, there are so many patients coming down with Omicron variant, upper respiratory, mild infections, um, even after vaccination and, uh, and getting boosted. And why is this happening? I'm sure Prof. Jayavira will uh, allude to that. And then the last but not least, ability to cause more severe disease. Now, we don't have that problem with Omicron variant, but in the unlikely scenario, there are more variants coming in. So we had to expect, expect these five features from most of those variants. Next slide, please. So how would you prevent uh, the hospitalization? That's the most important. How do you prevent infections? How do you prevent hospitalizations. In other words, how do you prevent severe disease and death, right? I have my formula called tri triple M's. It's easy to remember, masks. Masks are very important in appropriate situations. mRNA and other vaccines, uh, we know the importance of it. It is of utmost importance when it comes to containing a pandemic, even managing a pandemic, right? So we are going from phase one to phase two of this pandemic. Phase one was trying to contain the pandemic. We failed to do that, but we came up with so many tools. Now we are trying to manage the pandemic and live our lives. So mRNA and other vaccines are very important. And the third M is monoclonal antibodies. There are two types of monoclonal antibodies. The regular monoclonals that we give, Regeneron, Eli Lilly, and Sotrobimab, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, everything. Uh, those are after getting the infection. But there's a specific monoclonal antibody that we can get, uh, immunocompromised patients can receive from AstraZeneca. Uh, uh, and that one's called Evusheld, and that's for PrEP. This pre-exposure prophylaxis, that's the way we, the vaccines work. So there are monoclonal antibodies that will work like a vaccine. If you are unable to get a vaccine, if you are, have had a bad reaction to the vaccine, or if you've had a, a, a severe immunocompromised situation. Next slide, please. Uh, this doctor, uh, we, I like to pay a, a huge tribute to this doctor, 
who is called uh, Sir Edward Jenner, who is considered the father of vaccinology because he introduced to the world the concept of vaccines by inoculating his uh, uh, 13 year old son of one of his uh, co workers uh, with a cowpox vaccine. So that they found out that people who had cowpox uh, are uh, evading uh, smallpox at the time, and that was the birth of uh, the vaccines. Next slide, please. So over the last two years, we have had so many vaccines. So I'm not gonna kind of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, people have alluded this to, to this uh, as, the, as the, the wonders of this uh, century. So the vaccines came uh, at breakneck speed and there are two, uh, two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and, and Moderna, two uh, viral vector vaccines, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, and then the, the two uh, inactivated vaccine from China uh, uh, and Sinovac and uh, Sinopharm. And those have been tremendously um, changing our lives for the better. And uh, unfortunately, some areas of this world are, are still suffering from something that we call vac vaccine shortage and other areas, uh, there, are, there are other dilemmas with regard to vaccines. Next uh, slide, please. These are the platforms that were uh, uh, taken advantage of in, in uh, making those vaccines. So I'm not gonna bore you with details here. As I, uh, as I pointed out, there are two mRNA vaccines, two uh, uh, viral vector vaccines, and, and then the two inactivated vaccines. But the most exciting uh, new technologies are being also used called protein subunit vaccine by Novavax. Now Novavax already got the approval from, uh, from uh, UK and, uh, and uh, European health authorities. It will be approved here in the United States very soon. This is a specific virus uh, it's va vaccine where uh, uh, a juvent is attached to, to their sp spike protein and can create an enormous amount of T cell and B cell immunity within a very short period of time. And it's been tested with very good results, 90% uh, efficacy rates. So uh, next slide, please. So once again, storage, when it comes to uh, uh, equitable access to vaccines is very important. Uh, when you talk about storage, Oxford vaccine, which is AstraZeneca vaccine, and uh, the uh, Sinovac and Sinopharm, as well as Novax, Novax and J Johnson Johnson vaccine, those all can be stored in, in, in a cheap refrigerated temperatures, whereas the two mRNA vaccines had to be stored, uh, and also the, the Sputnik vaccine, which is also a viral vector vaccine, had to be stored in sub-zero temperatures. Next slide, please. So when it comes to vaccines, we need to know to be or not to be, which is to be boosted versus not to be boosted. Now, I, I, let me point out very briefly, I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Jaiver will talk a little bit about vaccines and boosters too. The importance of a booster is very well known now because multiple, multiple studies have shown that the countries where the Omicron variant was playing havoc, such as the eight South African nations and then UK and uh, Europe, the studies from them, we've learned a lot. We've, we've learned that your Omicron specific antibody response drops to, to about 50, 40 to 50 percent, that range uh, within a matter of months after the second dose. So obviously with a 40 percent protection against uh, a, 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 a new variant called Omicron, we were like city targets. And then came the concept of the booster. Booster was the third dose for most of us. That will, will restore the, uh, the antibody levels to almost 90%. That's what we expect from, from uh, the vaccine. So thank God the, the booster concept was confirmed by multiple studies, even CDC recently uh, uh, recognized that with, with their, generally CDC and FDA approved these things um, after two uh, uh, you know, uh, fully powered uh, trials that boosters are gonna be the norm for us. And the real question, I'm pretty sure Dr. Jaiviro will answer that, would be, are the boosters going to be our normal, new normal every year? And my uh, perception at this point would be, yes, every year around the fall time, we will need a booster. If we want to keep our antibody levels healthy, and if we want to keep our T cell immunity healthy, so antibodies are produced by B cells, and T cells produce CD4 and CD8 response. 
if you cannot, for whatever reason, get this, then there are, there are certain monoclonal antibodies produced by AstraZeneca, which can act as PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, just like a wire. This is an added layer of protection, as you know, mostly with uh, world over. The booster is given with mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. Those are very expensive vaccine for, vaccines for the rest of the world, but that's what they've been doing. They've been purchasing this with and with our help from other countries and giving uh, this as uh, the Pfizer vaccine or Moderna vaccine as a booster to probably about uh, 60, 70% of the world. But there, uh, having said that, you know, when you talk about equitable access, there are certain parts of this world, certain countries where the regular vaccines are not available. So their vaccination rates are very, very low. Uh, we are not talking about the booster, we are talking about regular first and second dose. Uh, some actually, received the booster as a third dose even before the CDC and FDA approved it. Why? Because they realized, such as the ones that are heavily immunocompromised, patients who, are, who, have, uh, who have undergone transplants, patients who are uh, undergoing steroid treatment like prednisone, uh, prednisolone for asthma, COPD, high doses, long-term, patients who are under, uh, with rheumatological disease undergoing uh, uh, you know, a certain biologic agent treatment, and patients with AIDS and other immune deficiencies, they were required to receive a third dose uh, about six, seven months ago when they were available. That was a regular dose. So uh, you have to um, understand the Moderna vaccine, uh, the third dose is half the dose because the first and second doses were the full potential uh, doses, whereas Pfizer vaccine was the full dose. So that category of people, which is about 3% of the whole population of the United States, immunocompromised or severely immunocompromised ones, they, most of them received their third vaccine. So will there be a fourth vaccine or fourth dose for them pretty soon? Yes, definitely. For that category of people, I think they, if they have the means to get their antibody levels checked, if the antibody levels drop down to, to close to, uh, 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 you know, below 20, I should say, uh, the international units, then they should get the, the fourth dose without getting the, uh, the declaration from CDC, FDA, or WHO. Uh, J and J booster has to be given. Johnson and Johnson has to be given after two months. So remember the uh, the Pfizer, Moderna in this country. I'm talking about the United States. Pfizer and Moderna boosters have to be given uh, five months after the the second dose. Johnson & Johnson, two months after the second dose. In between, if you have had Omicron variant or any other COVID-19 variant, you have to wait for about a month or so. You don't want to give, you don't want to give yourself another booster on top of a, a, a active infection. I'm pretty sure that's one of the commonest questions that you guys, I've had Omicron. Uh, so a lot of people say, I've had Omicron very recently. Should I still need the booster? I would say, yes, wait for about a month. The CDC says wait for two weeks after your symptoms disappear and then get the booster. That's the best case scenario. But of course, there are people who are, who are um, arguing other ways. Okay, uh, the fourth dose. Uh, so the fourth dose is the second booster. We're going to talk about majority of us the second booster. I think it's going to happen probably towards the end of uh, summer. Um, uh, Again, only time will tell because this is an ever evolving story. Next slide, please. So what is Omicron variant? Very important, it was found in Botswana, quickly spread around uh, the Southern region of uh, Africa uh, in, among eight countries, end of November uh, or beginning of December, 2021. It was named B11529. There are sub three, 11529, there are three sub-variants, which are BA1, BA2, and BA3, uh, as we alluded to earlier. Um, WHO declared as this as a variant of concern in early December, very swiftly. Uh, we, so far, we have had alpha, beta, gamma, delta with delta plus, and then Omicron as the five variants of concern. So, so BA2 is called Omicron plus. Highly contagious, but less severe for majority of us, but those who are unvaccinated with uh, risk factors, those who are vaccinated with uh, immune compromised risk factors, uh, that's not so. Uh, it's gonna be very severe. And, and my, uh, most of my patients that I'm seeing right now, hundreds of patients are in the hospitals, but 90% of them are unvaccinated, sadly. And, and majority of them have uh, some kind of risk factor. Short incubation period compared to Delta and other variants. Why? Because it proliferates so much. So incubation period is about three days, meaning 
from the time that you inhale the virus and the, from the from, to the time that you express with symptoms, that period is typically about five to seven days for regular COVID-19, but only three days. So that you could get exposed and get the disease very quickly. So the best time to test would be day number five, day number three to five, I should say. If you test it before, your test will be negative. If you test it after the seventh day or so, you test, there's a chance that you might get a negative test. Those are false negative tests. Those are typically antigen tests. If you do a PCR, it's a different story, but we don't recommend PCR for, for diagnosis nowadays. So rapid antigen, that's the way to go. Mild symptoms, for a lot of us, it's mild upper respiratory symptoms like nasal congestion and uh, running nose and sore throat, and then body aches and pains like a flu. Next, next slide. Uh, this is why it's very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, contagious because of the multiple, multiple mutation. COVID-19 Omicron variant has about 50 mutations. Sadly, most of the mutations are sitting on top of the S S spike protein. About 30 mutations sitting on top of the spike protein completely changing the picture of uh, the common target that for, this, for the monoclonal antibodies and the vaccines. That is, that's why a lot of people are getting the infection in spite of uh, again, uh, getting vaccinated. But thank God, most of those infections are mild infections. But for an unvaccinated, unvaccinated person and for immunocompromised vaccinated person, that's not the story. Now, when you talk about the virus attaching to the cells, uh, there's a uh, area in the spike protein called receptor binding domain. That is impacted by about 10 mutations. So out of the 30 mutations of spike protein, about 10 are affecting the, uh, the, uh, the receptor binding domain. And that's why uh, this whole mechanism of attachment from the virus, of the virus to the cell is kind of messed up uh, with Omicron variant. So, so now you probably understand why Omicron variant is very different from the others. But I, I will keep saying for vaccinated people, Omicron variant is mostly uh, upper respiratory infection, but for vaccinated immunocompromised people, that's not so. For unvaccinated people, it's a completely different story. Next slide, please. These are the features of Omicron variant. We already uh, alluded to most of them. They, they, Omicron variant shows immune escape because of all the multiple, you know, you know, plethora of mutations, especially affecting the spike protein. It escapes immunity from the vaccines as well as the antibody, antibody therapies like monoclonal antibodies. The doubling time is very fast because it's very contagious. So every two to three days, the, every virus doubles. Reinfection rates are much higher compared to Delta because of the, the reasons that I already pointed out. 25% uh, for Omicron as a 9% of the Delta. Maybe as contagious or transmissible as measles. I don't, I'm not sure whether about, about it's as, me, as contagious as measles, but measles is the the, the most contagious disease known to mankind, uh, R0 is 1 to 16. But there are so many other diseases that are very contagious. I think that this could be branded in, in that category, such as smallpox, chickenpox, and even Ebola. Ebola and uh, H1, H5N1, the bird flu, those have uh, an, certain uh, viral flus from uh, hemorrhagic flus from uh, uh, African uh, continent. Those have the high ability to, to kill. Whereas these ones don't have that. Uh, less virulent and deadly per studies from multiple studies from UK and South Africa, less hospitalization. But in a country like this, where there are 320 million people, that's not so. Because when you talk about more infections, uh, although they are less virulent, there are some people who get the, the highest infections and they end up in the hospital. The hospitals are bleeding at this point. Hospitals and ICUs are bleeding. And, and deaths are kind of, deaths have been under control, but now it's emerging again. So we have had so many deaths with unvaccinated people, Omicron variant, last two to three weeks. Right now, we are trying to peak in California, in, in states like New York, they have already peaked. So hopefully that numbers will go down within the next uh, month, to two months, and we'll hopefully have a good time. But we should never be complacent. But at the same time, we should learn how to live our lives, right? We have to live our life. We have to manage this pandemic and we need to uh, block this whole concept that, okay, we need to stop everything. That's not going to happen because the, the, the countries are unfortunately hugely impacted, especially the poorer countries are hugely impact, impacted by this uh, variant. And, and, and of course, they don't have a, a strategy for the future. They don't have a good foundation and, and their infrastructure is very poor. So we have to manage this 
going forward. And that's the good news. When you have oral antivirals, we can manage this. All right, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk to you about the, the next slide. Next slide again. Uh, how do we uh, treat the future variants? So my approach is very simple. Now, going forward, how do we, if you get an infection, what do we do? If you get an infection in the future, whether it's Omicron or any other variant, you stay at home. That is the norm, right? Five days, you need to quarantine yourself, right? Unless you're a healthcare worker. Then if you're asymptomatic and um, tested positive, you still have to go and work by wearing N95. Because anyways, we do wear N95 masks in the hospitals. If you are symptomatic and tested positive for, for the first five days, you have to stay at home. And then the next five days, you have to, mild symptoms, you have to wear a mask. So total of 10 days of wearing a mask to prevent your infection going to somebody else. That's the, that's the approach, public health approach. Remember, we're talking about public health approach, which is constantly changing. And then the medications came in. That's there to stay. So what are the medications? So if you have had this, if you have, you have a risk factor to, for, to severe disease, such as, I'll tell you what, if you have cardiac disease, high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, uh, cardiac disease, like uh, coronary artery disease, poorly controlled diabetes. Of course, if you have had, uh, if you uh, have uh, been on uh, steroid treatment for asthma, COPD, um, transplant patients, all those people will have to start oral antiviral pills right away. There's no question about it. These pills have to be started. There are two types of pills, Pfizer, Paxlovid, and, and Merck, Molnupiravir. These have to be started within the first five days. Otherwise, the defects will be much less. So with Pfizer pill, Pfizer pill, oral pill, we have noted 89% reduction, almost 9% reduction in hospitalization. With the other pill, with the Molnupiravir, Merck pill, about 50% reduction in hospitalization, which is also a lot. But the latest studies show it's, it's less, it's 30%. But it's still, it's a, it's a great uh, way to mitigate your COVID infection. So what happens if you get COVID infection and you have risk factors for severe disease? You call up your primary care doctor and ask them to prescribe or ask about the oral antiviral pills, oral pills, five-day pills, just like the way you take uh, Tamiflu for influenza. Now, recently, FDA also approved remdesivir infusion, intravenous infusion for three days for, for people who have the highest risk factors for severe disease, right? So if you have highest risk factor for severe disease, such as a transplant patient, the uh, patients who are on biologic agents, patients who have immune deficiencies, those people will need intravenous remdesivir instead of oral antiviral pills. And those are given in three doses, day number one, day number two, and day number three, intravenously at the infusion centers or at uh, ERs or uh, urgent care facilities. And hospitals have been told about this. Hospitals are getting geared up for this new approach of remdesivir. Typically, remdesivir is given for, for severe disease in the hospital, for, for people who are on oxygen, who require oxygen. Monoclonal antibody, if you have a very high risk factor and you have no access to remdesivir, I would definitely call up uh, the infusion centers or urgent care in the ER in the area and ask for the monoclonal antibody cocktails. Sadly, with Omicron variants, FDA already told us uh, as of last week, that the, the two uh, monoclonals that we have been using, Eli Lilly preparation and Regeneron preparation, are not effective against Omicron. But Sotrovimab, the Glaxo GSK preparation, is still effective. So if it's up to me, I would give um, uh, Sotrovimab, the Glaxo preparation, for very high risk people who are tested positive. That is to prevent hospitalization. All these are done to prevent hospitalization and death. And fourth, last but not least, the other ancillary medications such as uh, steroid inhalers like budesonide, which is all, already shown by some studies in England, UK, um, fluoxamine, uh, flu fluoxamine, which is an antidepressant, which is SSRI or um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, uh, shown by Lancet Global Health article in January 2022, and then high dose vitamin C, vitamin D3, zinc sulfate, all these will prevent hospitalization. This is the future outpatient approach of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go through some of this, the, the next few slides very fast so that uh, we can invite uh, Dr. Jayavir and we can learn a whole lot from him as well. The, the COVID-19 new novel um, oral pills. There are two types, antivirals, which is Paxlovid by Pfizer and, and Molnupiravir by Merck. Paxlovid for five days has two medications in one, which is uh, uh, Neumetrovir 
and ritonavir. So ritonavir is one of the medications that we be used in HIV and other infections to boost the drug levels, PK levels. So all in all, Paxlovid is very well tolerated. Only side effects is that bad taste to, to your mouth, but it's completed five, five days, two ta three tablets, twice a day for five days. And Molnupiravir, four, four tablets, twice a day for five days. Should be started within the five days. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, this is the combination, same thing, 89% efficacy in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. It is already shown by the clinical studies called EPIC-HR trial. Safety concerns are mostly because of drug-drug interactions with other cardiac medications, but those are relatively mild ones. Only thing that we had to know about is, uh, is the blood thinners or the anticoagulants that we use for atrial fibrillation or any other reason. If you're on Eloquest, uh, which is uh, Apixaban, uh, or if you're on, of course, warfarin, then you have to be careful. You need to notify the doctor that, and, and you have to cut down the dose because your, your drug levels can be boosted. Those drug levels can be boosted by the Paxlovid pill. But other than that, main side effects is some nausea and some uh, bad taste to the mouth. Next one, please. Uh, these are the two uh, uh, components of uh, uh, Paxlovid, uh, Neometrovir, which is uh, showing pan-coronavirus activity. And next one. And the same thing, these are the study results. No deaths were reported in the study arm using the Paxlovid. So therefore, it's a, it's a, it's a great tool to have in the armamentarium of COVID-19 for the future. Next one, please. Molnupiravir uh, Molnupir is, is a little less effect than uh, the, the Pfizer medicine, oral pill. This is also oral pill, taken five days, four tablets, uh, four capsules, twice a day for five days. Minimum side effects. But the main side effect that we are worried about is, of course, mutagenicity. Uh, you know, um, it could cause uh, teratogenicity and mutagenicity in children. So basically, we don't recommend that for pregnancy. And for childbearing age uh, women, we recommend uh, some kind of contraception uh, to prevent getting, uh, you know, them getting uh, pregnant during the period that you are on voluntary. But that effect goes up after a couple of weeks' time. So that's the main worry that we have. Taken with or without food, five, uh, uh, four tablets, four capsules, twice a day for five days, preventing about 50% of hospitalization, but the latest studies show 30%, but it's still a great medication. Uh, next slide, please. Next one. Uh, so the monoclonal antibodies, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, uh, next uh, slide. So monoclonal antibody cocktails have been discouraged uh, by CDC and FDA and, and world over against Omicron variant simply because they're not effective. But this particular one called Sotrovimab by Glaxo, it has been shown some efficacy against COVID uh, uh, Omicron variant. So we're not just talking about Omicron variant, we're talking about Delta variant. 99% of the cases in the U US are Omicron. But the future, we don't know. There might be other variants. So the, these three tools are great tools in the arsenal against, against uh, uh, COVID-19 going forward, which, is, which are uh, Casirivimab, Imdemimab, which is the Regeneron cocktail, and then uh, Eli Lilly cocktail, uh, called Baristinab, and then last but not least, Sotrovimab, which is Glaxo, GSK preparation, even against Omicron variant. This is given in the form of intravenous infusions, 20 minutes infusion given in ERs and, and given by some outpatient infusion centers uh, and our infusion facilities. You just have to be aware of this and ask for these things when you get close. COVID-19, mild to moderate COVID-19, but, uh, but with high risk factors. Next, please. So again, this is the same thing about Regeneron cocktail and introduced for mostly for the other uh, variants. Typically, monoclonals don't work beautifully against uh, uh, most of the variants, with some variants, uh, such as Omicron. But the previous variants, they worked really nice. These are given after you get the infection for high-risk people, right? It's an intravenous, inter, intravenous infusion, monoclonal antibody infusion, lasts for about 20 minutes, and, and you can be discharged home after that. Next, please. Uh, so again, same thing about region one cocktail. Uh, next, please. So sotrovimab uh, is very uh, unique in the sense that it is effective against Omicron variants. So sotrovimab is also monoclonal antibody, as I alluded before. Uh, to before, uh, so so GSK and Viral Therapeutics introduced this, and right away we got the approval 
the, the, the health authorities in Europe and Australia approve sotrovimab as their main monoclonal antibody, uh, neutralizing the, even the Omicron variant. But finally, CDC and FDA approve this as the main one as well. And, and CDC and FDA in the United States uh, discourage physicians from using other two monoclonal antibodies because 99% of our cases are Omicron mad right now. Next, please. Uh, this is so unique because this particular monoclonal antibody is given uh, like a vaccine because this have a long effect efficacy, long effect on the body. This particular monoclonal antibody is given in the form of in intramuscular injections, two intramuscular injections will create antibodies in your body that will last for six months. So it's very similar uh, to vaccine. So those who, who cannot get vaccines, those who have had bad reactions to those COVID-19 vaccines, those who are immuno, heavily immunocompromised, who are not responding, whose bodies are not responding to the vaccine, that kind of people will have to remember that there's a monoclonal antibody from AstraZeneca, which was FDA approved. There's a shortage in supply right now, but it will be available very uh, uh, commonly uh, next few uh, months, two years. Next, please. So how do we treat severe infections? Now that is up to us, the, the infectious disease doctors, the, the uh, admitting physicians, and the pulmonologists, the intensivists. So when you are in the hospital requiring oxygen, that means your oxygen saturation drops below 92%. So when you have an infection, you're tested positive, you're required to test the oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter. If that below, if it drops below 91%, you are in trouble. That means you need supplemental oxygen. You need to go to the hospital. That's the time that we start pay, uh, pay, uh, you know, using the two main arms are supplemental oxygen and the medication. Supplemental oxygen and the medication. For supplemental oxygen, a lot of people require two liters, three liters, four liters, six liters. But after that, sometimes they require, as the picture shows, uh, BiPAP machines that will be fitted to your face and then even intubations. And then sometimes we use uh, specific uh, you know, devices called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, uh, that is to optimize your oxygenation. And those are available only in very few places. So this is very, very invasive to your body. That's why we are trying to prevent this stage and treat the outpatient stage very with effective medications. And then the medication that we use haven't changed much, steroids, remdesivir, antibiotics, and of course, uh, you know, anti-clotting medication called thromboprophylaxis. We do use heparin and also newer anti-coagulation, uh, coagula uh, coagulators. But the immune modulators that we use, tocilizumab and baricitinib, have been shown uh, mortality benefit. That are, those are specific intravenous medications when you are in, when we use when the patients are in crisis situation, we call it uh, a cytokine storm. And next please. So these are the CDC recommendations for COVID hospitalized patients. These are pretty well known now. We use uh, dexamethasone um, intravenous or oral uh, for patients who are on oxygen. Um, and we use remdesivir for the same category of people for five days intravenously, which is an antiviral. And we use uh, immune modulators such as tocilizumab and baricitinib who are actually going into uh, cytokine storm and dying. So before uh, that stage or at the beginning of that stage, we do give uh, two doses of tocilizumab intravenously, uh, 800 milligrams each of baricitinib, which is also an immune modulator oral form. Next please. Uh, treatment of severe COVID-19. My formula is DRAPE so that we won't forget anything. DRAPE, for D, D for dexamethasone. These are all happening in the hospitals even today. Dexamethasone, R for remdesivir, A for anti-inflammatory immune modulators like tocilizumab, baricitinib, and A for anticoagulants, uh, coagulants, and A for antibiotics, and P for pulmonary protocols such as inserus parameter and proning. Proning techniques are very well known, sleeping on your tummy. When you are hungry for oxygen, that's the best way to sleep. Sleep on your tummy or sleep, sleep on your sides. And the extras, vitamin C, vitamin D3, and zinc sulfate. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jaya Singh, for that excellent overview. Now, I heard recently that the WHO is warning people to expect 
an even more contagious variant uh, in the future. That is certainly concerning. And I read this morning that the BA2 variant is 1.5% more contagious than the original Omicron. Yeah. Uh, now, right, so it's all, I mean, very likely most of us are going to get, be exposed to it at some point. Now, it was heartening because this morning I uh, read this uh, article. It was a prelim preliminary report that said that two weeks after the booster, that the booster was 70% effective in preventing symptomatic illness from BA2, and it was 63% effective versus the original Omicron strain. I suppose the question would be to wait and see how much longer that protection would last. So I guess we'd have to stay tuned. Yes. But one, so thanks so much again, Dr. Jai Singh. So moving uh, along, our next speaker is Professor Dushanta Jayavira, who will be speaking on new testing and quarantine protocols, and he will be addressing previously submitted questions. Now, uh, please be aware that we do have a Q&A, so if you have questions, please do submit them through the chat line or on the Zoom, and we will certainly uh, try to get through all of them. Now, to introduce Dr. Dushanta Jayavira. Professor Jayavira has been working in infectious disease for two decades and is a professor in clinical medicine at the University of Miami. He oversees the infectious disease clinic at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, Jackson Health System, where over 3,200 HIV infected patients are managed. He is uh, served as the Executive Dean for Research and Senior Associate Dean for Research at the University of Miami, again, Miller School of Medicine. He is one of the lead investigators in the Miami Clinical and Translational Science Institute. So please, Dr. Uh, Javier, if you will take the podium, so to speak. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I got to. The most difficult thing is to get the slides to work, okay. Okay, so thanks again. Um, I want to thank the Sri Lanka Foundation uh, for giving me the opportunity. Most of all, I want to thank Walter and Aisha. <clears throat> and I never met any Sri Lankan who has done so much for Sri Lanka, to my knowledge, uh, and uh, continues to do. And uh, it doesn't matter what it is that the Walter and Aisha and the Sri Lanka Foundation has always stepped up and done this. And then, of course, I want to thank uh, Shamod and uh, Kishini, who is always uh, organizing things for us. And of course, Deepthi, who uh, invited me and, uh, and also the, uh, the host. Uh, uh. So uh, my task is fairly simple. Uh, I'm charged to talk about the testing and quarantine, which is fairly simple. And of course, answer the questions that uh, people have submitted uh, initially. So there is a certain amount of overlap, what I'm going to say with uh, what uh, excellent talk given by, uh, by uh, Deepthi, who pretty much covered everything uh, you need to know. But they, so there may be here and there a little bit of uh, information you may gather from here. Uh, this is a picture from uh, my alma mater, which all of you know. Uh, uh, it looks still looks good, you know. So, so the objectives of my uh, talk is going to be COVID testing and performance characteristics, quarantine and the contact tracing, and the frequently asked question on COVID nineteen. So, I'll try to make as interesting as possible for you uh, uh, with uh, with these topics. So my financial disclosures, I'm, uh, I'm mostly a researcher, which I get funded from Gilead, Viv, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, NeuroRx, and I'm mostly funded from the National Institute of Health, NIAID, and NCATS, and you know, you see the balance. So let's start with COVID testing and performance characteristics. So, so, so the, as Deepthi said, you know, the, the most of the things that we are doing is the antigen testing, you know, the, the, the home testing or the, the point of care testing uh, is mostly antigen based. So the advantage of some of the, some of the, so I will discuss this in detail as we go on. 
Some tests provide results within minutes, other require some more time. Some may have to be provided in the laboratory and some at point of care. For example, PCR tests are always done uh, in the laboratory. I have a PCR machine uh, in our research unit, so I can run a test anytime I want, and it gives me the result in 45 minutes. Uh, and then some tests are very sensitive, which means that very few false negative results or misdetections, and some are very specific, very few false positive tests. So these are important because uh, uh, if you get a false negative, then you know you're going to spread the infection. If you get a false positive, you know you're going to be out of work for, for no reason. So, so this is important. So, so the important thing is to understand the viral dynamics, the, all these testing algorithms have been, have been decided based on the, the viral dynamics. So viral replication, if you look at the, on the y-axis, like you know, the, the viral load in copies, you can see, and then you can see the, the days since exposure is given on the, on the x-axis. And you can see that from the time you're exposed by the third day, the viral may, virus may be detected by doing a PCR, and it usually have at least a thousand copies for us to detect. So if you test too early, you may not pick it up, uh, but if you test too late, then you are spreading the infection. I'll get to that a little later. So, and then the viral load peaks up in about a couple of days, in like four to five days. And you can see that, you know, these other gray lines, you know, there's a variation among different, different people, depending on your immune system, as I think Deepthi said, depending on your comorbidities. There are so many factors that affect uh, the viral replication and of course the different variants. And then the, 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 then after some time, as your immune system kicks in, there's a gradual decay of the viral virus because this decay happens because the immune system is kicking in. And, and then this is, although it's not robust, but at least even some response is faster. So, and then the control point is that the, what about 13 days? Uh, the, the the detection may be the, may be so you may lose it and sometimes the symptoms onset is later and of course there may be a prolonged clearance so the test that we commonly use is called nat test nucleic acid amplification test this is specifically so this is i, I have another the following slide they'll compare the nat test versus antigen detection this is specifically that this is looking at the RNA of the virus. That's the, the, the genome of the virus. Uh, the pro, the, this process makes more copies of the RNA. And then you try to figure out whether this is actually COVID or not. Now, this, re, this increase in, the, so if you have 10 copies, what the machine does is that it will make 10,000 copies and then try to figure out what exactly is there. So this, this increase the PCR, at least the, the PCR test can be done by either, either reverse transcript test PCR. That means that you take RNA and co convert it to DNA copy and then replicate it. Or there are other things like isothermal amplification, which means that you don't need to have ch changes in temperature. You can use the constant temperature. So that makes isothermal amplification much easier than this RT-PCR. So these are technical things, but the bottom line is that are in the the piece, the nucleic acid amplification is pretty pretty specific so the important things about this doing this test is that it's important to identify early so if you look at this slide if you if you pick this up case very early and if you isolate yourself if uh, infectious but isolated you can remove 65% of the infectiousness down, downstream. And if you go to the next line, if you delay that, if you delay that, then you lose about 34% of the infectious uh, 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 spreading. So, and if you look at this side of the curve on the right side, you can see this blue is the missed or caught late. You can see at 14 diets, the, the infectionness is still very high. So the, 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 reason, the, the whole purpose of this slide is to say, if you're sick, get yourself tested. Don't wait for the result. Isolate yourself. Lots of people try to say, oh, no, this is the common cold. This is that. This, you know, I'm not infectious. Uh, 
I myself has come across where I have attended dinners where somebody is not feeling well and I ask, you're not feeling well? And they say, oh, no, 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 I, I, I've been boosted and all that. And I would very politely say, you know, I think you should wear a mask. And I immediately started wearing mask. Next day, I get the call saying, yeah, I was positive. So, so this is what we are trying to avoid. The whole purpose of this slide is to say that if you have symptoms, isolate yourself, do not wait for the test results. So, so this is the, the kind of, you know, the curvature, uh, the, 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 the viral load decay characteristics and which test is should be done at what time. If you do the antigen detection, it is pretty good, but it has limitations. It has to have a high viral load for you to get it. On the other hand, the RT-PCR uh, RNA detection, is it can happen much, much earlier. In fact, the RT-PCR will pick it up much earlier compared to antigen detection, and RT-PCR will last longer. Testing will be more positive longer compared to, uh, say, uh, uh, you know, antigen detection. So, so if I wanted to compare, so the NAT test versus antigen test, uh, I mean, as Deepthi said, you know, we use the antigen test because it's cheaper and it's more effective, more, sorry, it's convenient. Uh, in the antigen test, you're actually looking at the antigen, you know, either spike protein antigens or nucleic capsid antigen or different antigens, whereas the, uh, the viral, the, the NAT test is actually looking at the, the genes, the RNA, looking at the RNA. The specimen wise, the NAT test, you can do with the sputum and saliva, whereas antigen test is mostly nasal and nasal pharyngeal because you need a higher amount of virus for it to be more, effect, more uh, effective. Uh, then the specificity is pretty much better in good in both, but NAT test has an edge. Test complexity is NAT is much more difficult compared to antigen testing. And then the turnaround times, NAT test takes longer, whereas the antigen test is much faster. But you know, if you if you have a, a PCR test in your office, you know, you can run that without any problem. So if you take the advantages of the, uh, the PCR or NAT test versus the antigen, basically the most sensitive test method available is the NAT, whereas the advantage of the antigen testing is the short and round time, which is convenient. Then of course, this advantage is the opposite of that. Uh, the uh, PCR is more expensive compared to that, which is uh, less expensive and may, maybe cheaper. So one of the questions they ask is how do COVID-19 tests at, work at home? I think the answer is that you can do the antigen or the NAT. Even the home tests can be sent out to the lab. Uh, but the antibody tests which uh, people have, uh, that's not used for uh, diagnosis of active infection. I have great reservation about the antibody tests because the specificity and the quantity of the antibiotic and the, and the quality of the antibiotic, uh, anti antibodies will determine whether you're protected or not. So some people say, oh, I have high antibodies, so I won't get the infection. But which is not true because uh, uh, it is very hard to quantify unless in a, in a research setting. So, as I think DP alluded, that you know this is the algorithm that has been uh, currently told. I will be taught. If you are symptomatic, you know you can do the rapid antigen test, and if it is positive, then you 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 need to consider that you are positive. And if your population screening, you do the same thing. If it's negative, no need to uh, quarantine. But whenever these are negative, then if you have symptomatic or asymptomatic, I think it's always better to do RT-PCR and make sure that it is, uh, it is uh, negative. So now let me get into the quarantine because uh, uh, that's one of the things that Deepthi asked me to talk about. Uh, uh, what do you, you know, what are the quarantine requirements, you know? I mean, I, basically if you test positive for COVID-19, you know, stay home for five days. If you have no symptoms um, and after five days, you can leave your house, we are a mask for another five days. If you have fever, of course, you know, until your fever is solved, you, you should stay. And very likely that if you uh, have this, you know, you should go and get yourself tested again, because it is possible that if you did the antigen test, that it was false uh, negative. Now, if you expose someone with COVID-19, if you have been boosted, 
or complete a primary series of mRNA vaccine or a J and J. You don't, just for exposure, you don't have to be at home, but you have a mask for 10 days and test uh, after five days if possible. But if you get developed symptoms, then of course you need to, you know what to do. Then if you're unvaccinated, it's a completely different ball game. You know, like Deepji said, you know, we, most of our patients uh, that we are seeing who are uh, hospitalized are the unvaccinated. I mean, uh, I am I'm running a couple of uh, uh, inpatient uh, clinical trials with the National Institute of Health. And uh, we are having difficulty in enrolling patients uh, for the inpatient study, whereas I have two studies on the outpatient side. I have plenty of patients because with the Omicron, as you know, that most of them are at home. And so, you know, they, they, um, they get enrolled very quickly. One of the studies that I'm doing is uh, comparing fluoxamine, what uh, Dipti was talking about, flucytosin and uh, fluticasone, and also ivermectin, uh, comparing with the placebo, uh, uh, placebo uh, control. And uh, we have enrolled uh, almost a thousand, no, close to a thousand patients in uh, ivermectin arm. And we are now trying to see what dose of ivermectin would be the best uh, to prevent, but we don't have the data yet. The data is blinded. So we are waiting for the analysis. So, uh, so what to do for isolation? I mean, that's another thing that's very important, right? You monitor your symptoms. You know, if you have like a difficulty in breathing, obviously you have to get care. Live in separate rooms, uh, use a separate bathroom and you know, make improve your ventilation. Avoid contacts with household members. Don't share household items and you know, wear a battery mask. I mean, these are common sensical things. One of the problems in the modern world is that the common sense is not at all common, you know. Politicians don't have common sense. Uh, regulators don't have common sense. And, you know, we learn from them. So all of us are losing our common sense, you know. So this is very important that you maintain your mindful common sense. I mean, in Buddhism, they say mindfulness. I mean, that is exactly what we need in uh, COVID-19 to be mindful of what, what is going on. So here are some of the questions that were brought up. Uh, so I will try to answer all those questions now. Uh, I mean, some of these things have deep has already answered. So therefore, uh, whenever it is redundant, I will uh, skip or sometimes, you know, repetition is good because you, you know, try to remember these things. So many are getting infected after getting all the vaccines. How do you explain that, you know? I mean, the, the simple answer is that vaccines protect the most infections. There's nothing 100%. The main advantage, uh, as previously mentioned, was that it decreases severe infection, death, and ICU admissions. So as we all have seen, the people who get admitted to hospitals are the older, the immunocompromised, and the comorbidities are cancer, obesity, diabetes, and you know all the other pulmonary diseases. So those are the ones who, who, who really get, uh, get in trouble. So, so when you say that I'm boosted, I'm vaccinated, that I'm protected, I'm protected against getting a severe illness, not getting infected, because it is what it is. Uh, can you be reinfected with COVID-19 after you have Omicron infection or get Omicron twice? Yes, I mean, it basically depends on, uh, you know, your immune response and how long after the initial infection. I have a couple of slides later on about how long your immune response lasts after infection. And uh, if you're immunocompromised or if you had a mild infection, which does not, it may not generate some robust, robust immune reaction. I mean, there's some controversy about that too, uh, whether the, there's a huge difference in the immune response between the robust, the, between the mild and the moderate, the, the jury is still out. And uh, to the end, towards the end of my talk, I have some really interesting uh, uh, points to share with you, uh, which the Nature magazine, uh, ask five or six world experts. One of them is uh, Malik Pires. I'm very proud of Malik. Uh, I'll get to that later. So my next question was, how long does it take to develop immunity after COVID-19 infection? So in general, in four weeks, you are developing, I mean, you're developing immune response as you get infected. It, it gradually picks up. That's why, as, as you know, you saw the viral load decay, 
the viral load goes up and comes down, that is simply because the, the immune response. Although it's not very robust at the beginning, even a couple of days after being infected, but as time goes on, in four weeks, you're, you're having a pretty good response um, against uh, spike protein as well as the nucleocapsid proteins. 98% uh, of the participants in this study from NIH showed that in one month, they have pretty decent uh, levels. And, it, and after about six to eight months, it starts declining uh, because uh, that's the decay of the antibodies. Uh, and 95% of the people had at least three out of five immune system components that could recognize COVID-19 uh, up to eight months after infection. So, so I think deeply eluded that, you know, the T cells and the, you know, the B cells and the, you know, dendritic cells, um, there are multiple, multiple facets of uh, immune system that is fighting this. You know, it's like your, your, your national defense, you know, you have the army, the police and the, you know, air force. Uh, Marines, the whole works. So immune system works similarly. And that just looking at one does not tell you the whole story. So does regenerate our work on Omicron? So I, I think Deepthi uh, 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 already said that, you know, about the 20 mutations on the spike protein gene. But so this was coming from the NIH, looking at the different, uh, different uh, uh, the vaccines, and the different variants, as you can see, the top, these are the different variants. And you can see the, the, the Omicron, which is uh, B11529, you can see that, that it has uh, the only, the, the activity is pretty much reduced, even for that, uh, against, the, uh, against uh, you know, if you go to the right side, it's less active, the left side, no reduction. So you can see that there is fair amount of uh, uh, loss of activity. But Despite all that, despite all that, we, we know that it'll, it'll prevent severe infection. But at the same time, this explains why people are getting infected despite the vaccine. So, I mean, it is what it is, you know? And if you look at the, the other medications, I'm just going just off topic right now. If you think it like, looks like Paxlovid or Remdesivir or, or Mol 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 Molnupravir, none of those are really affected by these uh, variants. Uh, because the variants are affecting the spike protein mostly, and these drugs are working at uh, more molecular level at uh, you know protease inhibitors and polymerase inhibitors. So those polymerase genes and those genes are not affected by the the mutation that are happening in the spike protein and other areas. But the danger would be that if the virus, as uh, I think uh, uh, the moderator who mentioned that. If there was a mutations happen, if there were mutations happening in the other genes, now that the the things could go south pretty quickly. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, what really happens is that the for the virus, I mean virus to mutate, there has to be selective pressure. Uh, so so far, this has not been uh, give, done because we are not using uh, that much uh, of uh, monolopavir or, or Paxlovid, but the, the thing to, to watch is that when you start using these drugs, how quickly the virus will mutate against uh, Paxlovid or monoclonal because we know the virus always beats us. Uh, you know, we, we learned that in HIV, hepatitis C, but, uh, but we have to be keep on top of this, uh, developing new and newer drugs to overcome some of these things that we anticipate would happen or could happen. You know, we don't know. This is a very different game. And these are the other the monoclonal antibodies that Deepti was talking about. So Sotrivimab is the one that has this uh, the best activity uh, in the current situation. So, and then this is a cartoon of like the graphic representation of how uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 binding uh, domains have changed. The, uh, the, the red line is the, 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 the angiotensin two receptor binding has gone down with Omicron. Uh, and, and quite significantly. So can patients have, uh, can patients who have recovered from COVID-19 continue to have detectable viral load uh, COVID-19 in the upper respect? Yes, that can happen. Uh, I think one of the problems is that, you know, 
the, these these viruses can they, they can spew out these viruses. But the good thing is that uh, after ten days, the amount of virus that comes out is very low. The second thing is that uh, the 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 uh, they're not being able to infect other people. So infectiveness of the people has gone down, but it also, but still people can be spewing out uh, viruses, they, but they may not be infectious. Uh, it all depends also on how, uh, how, 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 uh, uh, how many comorbidities you have. So if your immune system is very poor, and so the virus is, is at a stronger position, and may have a higher viral load, and you could be potentially infectious longer than 10 days. So, so you can't say that one size fits all. It's everything has to be, that's why that you, you have to work with a physician who will advise you what is best for you. How long am I infectious after COVID-19? So in general, it's 10 days. In general, that's what the CDC says, and you know our quarantine requirements and everything says 10 days. But if you're severe, or critical illness, you may go up to about 20 days. So again, I'm, I'm cautioning that, that don't take these things as gospel truth. I mean, these things could change, you know, depending on the degree of, uh, uh, of illness. And some people have, we have found out up to three months uh, during illness, but we may not consider them as uh, infectious. Should I get a COVID-19 vaccine if you have been treated with monoclonal antibodies? Yes, you should, you know, because, but the CDC says wait for 90 days, but in UK, and it's about 30 days. I mean, I think that's what Deepthi also said. Uh, this is from the NIH, basically saying, you know, wait for 90 days, but I think uh, 30 days would be reasonable if you, uh, if you're giving, uh, if you had monoclonal antibodies. So can the test determine which COVID-19 variants I have? Yes, we can do a test to find out which variant you are. I think Deepthi always mentioned about the S, uh, the S protein dropout. My next slide I will show you. So basically, in the I think Deepthi already talked about the uh, Omicron. You know, there are these clusters of mutation happening in different areas. So what Omicron does is that uh, it happens in the receptor binding domain and other domains where, uh, with, with resistance to neutralizing antibodies. So that's why the therapeutic uh, monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies won't work. And there's a cluster of mutations adjacent to S1, S2 uh, fusion cleavage site with basically uh, enhanced transmissibility and improves entry into the cells. And then similarly, then, you know, uh, also the enhanced transmissibility and then increase infectivity. I'm not going to go into details. So the S gene dropout is that when you do, when you do a PCR test, it looks for three genes, the spike protein gene, the nucleocapsid gene, and the envelope gene. You know, there are three genes they're, they're going after. And then when you, when, you, when you sequence the virus, the S gene, because it has mutated, the, the probe that we are using doesn't pick it up. So it is called the S gene dropout. So, so that is a kind of a surrogate marker that, wow, this could, be, uh, this could be Omicron. Now, if you really want to be confirming this, you have to do a whole genome sequencing, which is going to cost like you know, a couple of thousand bucks. So what we do is that for surveillance purposes, we take like you know, 10% of the S gene dropouts and then we sequence. And if you get 100% of them coming as, uh, as uh, Omicron, then we know, okay, so our testing methods are, are, are validated. So the other question was, can the test determine if I have antibodies to COVID-19 variants? This is difficult. I mean, we don't do this. We don't do antibodies to see for COVID-19 variant. And I have caution about testing antibody levels. First of all, even at LabCo or, or Quest, when they say that high antibody levels they're not doing real classical quantitative uh, viral load uh, assays. They have a yes or no answer and they're, they're predicting it. So we don't recommend people to go by these antibody tests because that doesn't truly uh, uh, tell you your, your immune or not. The other thing is that it's only the humoral immunity. It doesn't talk anything about cellular immunity. So. So it is, it is like a childish to say that you have antibody level good and I should be protected. So I, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't recommend that. 
the other interesting question about what do the contact tracers do? What is contact tracing for students during? I mean, this is this was this was important at the beginning, but now we have almost got to the point of pandemic. And then it's not that that important, you know, contact tracing. I mean, basically, it is basic public health uh, issue. It's a fundamental activity that involves working with a patient who has a diagnosis, and then you try to contact, and then you isolate them. It's a core disease control measure. So I have to tell you, and I want to tell you, the Sri Lankan government did a pretty cool thing very at the beginning. I mean, hats off to the Sri Lankan government for doing that. When I saw their uh, strategic plan uh, when when it just developed it uh, one of my colleagues shared it with me and one of the things they did was this they they used the bluetooth technology and uh, and dual locations and you could say that predict that if somebody if somebody came within six feet of other person by doing that, you can say that you these are your contacts and you can contact them. So I know that the government was under a lot of pressure from, you know, naysayers saying, oh my God, you know, you, you are destroying our, you know, privacy and, uh, and all this nonsense. They were blaming the Sri Lankan government. <clears throat> but the Israelis were doing that. The Chinese were doing that. Most of the Europeans were doing that. So I think Sri Lanka started very early, and if we wrote a paper, myself and Sarod Jaisinger, uh, we got published uh, in one of the public health journals. We compared our experience with uh, uh, Vietnam, and we showed that we did a pretty good job. Uh, of course, things went south after that. I mean, everybody had problems, but we did a pretty good job. So what I'm trying to say about contact tracing is that although you can do this physical contact tracing, that this modern technology helps to uh, uh, to do this better and this is what the cdc work uh, in the workflow is that you know you contact people and you isolate them and you prevent other people getting infected and so another interesting question that has been asked what is the best mask to wear now you know that you know droplets uh, uh, is a form of spread and the formites also i think uh, rodney was saying about the formites and that the omicron has a longer survival uh, you know, the things that we are not sure is that is survival equal to infectiveness? These are these are the important questions that we don't know the answer. Uh, and so, so this is a study, I can't remember who did this, but it came up from CDC. So, so if you look at this, you know, on the on the X on, on the on the horizontal axis, you know, nothing, cloth mask, surgical mask, or N95, or that's a person not infected person not infected wearing, and here is a person infected wearing. So if we all wore N95 mask, uh, then we could, be, we could be with somebody for 25 hours and nobody would get infected. Now, at this moment, I want to allude to you that what is a contact? Contact is defined as at least 15 minutes of face-to-face -face within six feet with the person who is infected. That's the CDC definition, for at least 15 minutes. So if you spend five minutes with one person who is infected, five minutes with the other person, five minutes with the third person, it's still 15 minutes. So 15 minutes in one hour, if you are with face to face. So if we have N95 mask, and if you have, if we all go N95, it's 25 hours. If you don't do nothing, in, uh, <clears throat> and nothing and nothing in 15 minutes you're exposed, you'll get infected. The cloth mask, I know it's fashionable, but it's, I think it's just fashionable, that's all. Uh, I mean, it gives you a little protection, right? So, so the real uh, McCoy here, the surgical mask, uh, surgical mask or the N95. So I think I want to hats off to President uh, Biden for, for producing, mass producing N95. I was, shocked by the sloppiness of our, our, the United States response to this, because I remember when, when Delta, you know, before Delta came, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the, the, when the uh, pandemic was sort of slowing down, as Deepthi said, the company that was making N95 went out of business because suddenly nobody was uh, paying for N95 because again, the supply chain from China and other countries were coming up. 
And fortunately, you know, President Biden supported the mask and of course with Omicron and 95 has come back again. So I think it's very important that we try to use the 95 as much as possible, at least a surgical mask, or you could even double mask. And this shows clearly that if everybody, uh, you know, if everybody wear mask, high adherence, nobody will get infected. But if nobody wears mask, everybody will get infected. So I think this is not very sexy. It is, you know, it's everybody can do it, but nobody takes it. You know, it's very important that we, we take this seriously. So how long am I infectious after COVID? It's usually 10 days. I always mentioned that. I'm going to skip this. Should I get a COVID-19 vaccine if you have COVID? Yes, yes. Now, look at this in my next slide. So this was from Kentucky. So, so Kentucky, they, they just published this in MMWR, reduced risk of infection with after COVID vaccination. So they took people who have been uh, Kentucky residents uh, in May to June 2021, sorry, uh, compared that with residents who were not reinfected. So uh, they were, and then they looked at case control study unvaccinated versus vaccinated. So they are looking at the people who are infected and got vaccinated versus people who are infected and didn't get vaccinated. So what it showed was that, what it showed was that, that if you were vaccinated, you were two and a half times less likely than getting second infection, two and a half times less. But there were caveats, there were caveats. Reinfection was not confirmed through whole genome sequencing. Persons who have been vaccinated are possibly less likely to get tested. So therefore the association reinfection and lack of vaccination may be overestimated. Vaccine does not, does doses administered federal and out of state sites are not typically entered in the state registry. Uh, although the case controls are matched to age and sex, the unknown other confounders might not be present. This is a retrospective study, a single state, two month study. So, so there are caveats. So, so two things that I wanted to show in this study. First of all, if you get infected, if you get vaccinated, there is a possibility that it is, you will get a better response and you won't get infected. It's a possibility. Nothing is, nothing is for sure. The second thing is that when you read papers, you have to look at the last paragraph, which gives you all the caveats. Because otherwise, if you read only the headlines, you think, oh my God, this is like, you know, really good. But actually you, you look under the hood and you realize, well, there are questions about the study. So I just want to share with that. So there was another question about the post-acute sequelae of uh, PASC or the post-acute sequelae of COVID infection. There are multiple things that are coming out, you know, four or four, five weeks, four or more weeks after the COVID. And these are the symptoms that you get with the post-COVID syndrome, right? Post, it's called a post-acute sequelae or PASC. You know, you can have all these symptoms. This is one of the things that kind of kind of uh, confuses the COVID researchers why this is happening. I'll get to that a little later. So, I mean, you can have all these uh, minor side effects. Not they are not minor. If you're losing hair, it's not more minor. I mean, I lost my hair even before COVID, but uh, this is, these are not minor for, for the person who is infected. And you can see there are so many other things that are happening. Then the pregnancy. It's very important to understand that you have to get, uh, you, should, you shouldn't be worried about uh, uh, getting vaccine pre pregnancy. It's better to vaccinate than getting COVID. So there were a few other questions about the boosters. You know, is the same formulation? Yes. Uh, if we need boosters, does it mean vaccines are not working? No, the vaccines are working, even against Delta, but with time, the immunity wanes. What are the risks of getting a booster? Same as vaccine taken before. Can I mix and match? Sure. Can we do it? Yeah. If I have COVID, do I need to get a vaccine? I already said that. I'm still fully vaccinated if I do not get a booster. Yes, you're still fully vaccinated. But you know, after some time, we will change that. So let me come to the, my last bit. What is unclear about COVID? The Nature magazine present, uh, wrote this paper, they wrote this uh, article talking to a couple of uh, world experts. The first thing was Ling Fa Fang from Duke. Ask, uh, he, his biggest question was origin of COVID-19. Now you will never get the answer because no country wants to say that we started it. So we will never find the answer. 
but from Princeton, so the, the group of researchers from Princeton said, we don't know how long this shift from pandemic to endemic or epidemic will take. Now we do need the characteristics of a steady state. How the vaccination structure will affect these patterns? We don't know. We can predict, we can make up these stories, but we don't know the facts. Which population are new variants occurring? We don't know. We, 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 we have not defined it yet. What are the characteristics of breakthrough infection? We don't know that. Are they different from the primary infection? What are the, what's the susceptibility of vaccine relative to that of unvaccinated people? Are breakthrough infection less transmissible? We don't know the answer to that either. Are infections more likely to occur in different immune profiles, depending on prior natural infection, specific vaccinations, specific viral strains? How long does this happen? So these are all unanswered questions. These have a lot of... Then from Vanderbilt, Catherine Edwards, the lower vaccination rates are have, having a higher burden of disease and higher death rates. What we don't know is whether everybody needs to be boosted or how often we need a boosting. Do we need the fourth shot? That again, we are just predicting things on based on very small studies without having a really good idea. The best answers came from Malik Pires from Hong Kong. We still don't know the relative contribution of small airborne aerosols versus droplets. I think there was a paper, I think deeply briefly mentioned about the, this is spreading like, um, uh, uh, like measles in the Omicron because it's a viral spread, the, the airborne spread. So you don't have to be just six feet across. You could be 10 feet across and you could get it if it's airborne. We also don't know the infectious, more infectious variants are Delta increased transmission. I mean, we know, but we don't know about Delta. We don't know yet fully understand how much different vaccine reduce transmission. What's the durability, okay? What happens when vaccinated individuals get breakthrough infection? And what's the interaction? If vaccination followed by a usually breakthrough infection provides broad immunity, then it gives you a good, good uh, question. That basically is saying that if you, we need to create vaccines which can be in, can be sprayed in the nasal spray, you know, like polio vaccine, or you know, so that the most of the injected vaccine do not create a good immune response in our mucosal immune response. So perhaps the next generation of vaccines could be, uh, you know, like a different vaccine, not injected but inhaled or or or, or you know, sprayed in your intranasal. So I was very fascinated by Malik Pires's uh, question. And of course, uh, the final one was from King's College Inspector saying, why do some symptoms happen three to four months? I mean, I, I already mentioned that past, why does it happen? So, so these are the things that are burning questions that need to be answered among all the simple questions. But at the end of the day, we are all uh, trying to find answers. And I always tell my students, that 50% of the stuff that I say is wrong. The problem is I don't know which 50%. With that, I'm going to, I'm going to end this talk and, uh, and thank you for listening. I want to acknowledge uh, Sri Lankan Foundation, uh, Walter and family and Keshini and Chamod. And of course, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayabira, for that wonderful presentation and that very, very detailed response to all the questions. I'm sure everybody was fascinated by those responses. Now, in listening to the presentations, it made me think, I mean, the, the boosters clearly do reduce the risk of developing uh, severe disease and hospitalizations. But despite the freely available status of vaccines in this country, we haven't really seen people who have been fully vaccinated, say with two mRNA doses or say Johnson & Johnson shot. They haven't really um, uptaken the boosters as much as we would have hoped. So they're clearly not say, opposed to vaccination because they got the initial shots, but there's a hesitancy somehow to get the booster. And the concern is if we are expected now going forward to require, say, a booster annually, will there be an even further drop off going forward where people just don't want to take more and more shots? And what will the implications be? If you want to take it. 
Yeah, so I would, uh, uh, again, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good point, Dinesh, that you brought up. So study after study is showing the importance of booster, boosters. But we have to understand those are the boosters for the, for the adult people, right? WHO clearly said with their studies that kids don't need a booster. And they were flat out about that. And I agree with that. When there's a shortage of vaccines around the world, there's inequitable access around the world. Well, we're talking about boosters in the Western world for kids, for heaven's sake. It's a big no-no, right? So now fully vaccinated is we, the, uh, we defined as two vaccines for the rest of the vaccines and, of course, for Johnson Johnson, one. But Johnson Johnson had their issues, so I would definitely recommend a, a booster of Johnson Johnson, as we already uh, were preaching about from the beginning, right? Uh, so only time will tell how the booster effect will uh, kind of uh, like, you know, get into the real data, real world data, only to, because we, we just started giving the boosters, right? At this point, I personal thing that I agree with the Shant, the answer is we don't know. <laughs> we don't know whether they're actually the boosters. Yeah. But chances are, when you talk about antibody levels, yeah, that is real, right? Antibody levels are restored to 90% or 80% that's required for, uh, for symptomatic uh, and also 95% for uh, hospitalizations. That part, yes. But how that is uh, uh, actually uh, translated to real life data, Real world data, we don't know at this point. And human nature equation. Yeah, yes. Dinesh, yeah, I have a point. Uh, the, yeah. So, so general. So, I'm just about to start a Omicron specific uh, vaccine study. Um, so, we were doing a sort of a focus group and see what people want. I think people, if you come up, came up with the Omicron specific thing, then the people are interested. But if you say the same thing, they're not interested. It is, it is very strange that because I think people are beginning to think that uh, uh, what's the point in doing the same thing? They don't understand the basic principle that, you know, that antibodies vain, that you need a boost no matter what it is to get it, keep it up, you know. Uh, so so that, that, is, that is my observation in Miami, at least. Yeah. Thank you. And then thinking about the oral antivirals. I mean, they sound fantastic. Uh, I have to say in my local area, there is a shortage and patients are having a hard time accessing them. But that also makes me think, well, global equity to the oral antivirals. I mean, if we're having a hard time finding them here in America, I can only imagine overseas. Um, but then also I was thinking, well, in comparison, say analogy, say to um, antibiotics, we see how patients take antibiotics, they start to feel better, and they don't complete the course. So if the same thing happens with the oral antivirals, uh, 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 molnupiravir, uh, uh, Paxlovid, would that then put pressure um, on the virus to mutate and then evade the oral antivirals as say there's more uptake of the oral antivirals globally and could we then end up with sort of a super COVID-19 variant? Uh, yeah so that, again uh, if you may Dushanta, so I would my answer to this is very simple now with regard to antivirals there are very few viral infections that we have the luxury of treating with antivirals, right? Mm -hmm. HIV, hepatitis C, we have, you and I, Dushanta, we have tons of patients, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Our patients are doing just fine. Why? Because they are taking that damn medication. I'm sorry about my language. That's it. That's all you are supposed to do. Just take that medication, you'll be fine. But if some chance, if you stop taking the medication or cut it short by two days, three days, there's always a risk of, of uh, resistance to it through mutation. So please don't do that. If you decide, with, if you have a high risk for severe disease, if you decide to take the medication, please complete the medication. That's the most important thing. And that actually stays uh, with all antivirals and antibiotics. Over to you, Dushan. Yeah, I think I think Deepthi's point is well taken. Uh, I think that the whenever you use antivirals, it's a battle between the host and the bug, you know. And soon as the level goes to subtherapeutic, 
the virus mutates. And especially with the mRNA, mRNA, sorry, what I mean was RNA viruses uh, doesn't have the proofreading mechanism. So they are spontaneously mutating all the time. There is no proofreader. So as a result, there is a chance of getting, uh, 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 getting resistance. So uh, I think the other thing that I'm beginning to see is that, so with Omicron, it's not very severe illness. So, so I'm recruiting patients for this, uh, uh, this uh, clinical trial. So when you call these patients, they, they don't feel that bad. So they say, well, I have infection, but I'm not feeling bad. So I don't want to go on the study. So it's the same thing with Paxlovid because I, so I, in fact, I tell the people, okay, I'll, I'll get you Paxlovid, but do you want to go on the study? Say, no, I don't want Paxlovid. I don't want the study because <laughs> they don't feel bad. So I think the, 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 the important thing that, uh, that Deepti was trying to say was that if you think you're severe enough, now the thing starts, you know. Well, compliance is key. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a few questions. Um, so let me just read them out. Does the fact that mRNA vaccines specifically target the spike protein while inactivated ones contain the whole virus make any difference on their efficacy against variants with spike protein mutations? Yeah, so uh, my answer to that is uh, mRNA. Yes, that's exactly what we were talking about. Most of this, the vaccines and the therapeutics, uh, uh, at least the vaccines and the monoclonals targeted on uh, uh, zeroed in on S protein, spike protein. Uh, and because of that, we are in this dilemma now. Any other platforms, will that make a difference? Again, studies are not coming out of China. So if uh, China can prove to us with their studies, that inactivated platform is the way forward, then I will take that, I will embrace that. Right now, I have to tell you that there are many more vaccines have been produced, more accurate third, fourth generation uh, uh, mRNA vaccines have been uh, manufactured right now or looked into right now. And then and by companies like GSK, Sanofi and so, so on. So, and the newer platforms and stuff. So obviously, yes, that question is always in the mix. What is the best? going forward or the path forward, which type of vaccines, the answer is out there, the jury is out there. And uh, over to you, Dushant, for further clarification. Yeah, I, I think your point is quite right. You know, the thing is that it is true that it may be a more attractive, but you need to show that it, it does work. You know, in theory, it may be interesting concept, uh, but it, we have to see how the studies pan out. Thank you. The next question is, please address the anti-vaccine groups who are largely growing in Sri Lanka, making it more difficult to manage. Can I take that? Yes. Sri Lanka had never had the anti-vaccine uh, uh, before. Uh, if you look at the WHO statistics on the vaccination, Sri Lanka had one of the highest vaccination rate children. We did fantastically well because we, despite we have been one of the you know, less fortunate countries with financially, we had a robust preventive, I mean, we are like a poster child for WHO, Costa Rica and Sri Lanka. So I do not understand why this has happened. Uh, this may be an infection that is spreading across United States, Brazil, South Africa, India, that this is this anti-science movement uh, which we see. So I, I am really shocked by why this is happening? Fifty. I, I would uh, I would agree with you, uh, Dashanta. I, I have no further comments. Thank you. The next question is: Is there a risk of blood clotting in AstraZeneca vaccine? My father died after seven days from taking second dose from a silent attack heard that some people have taken aspirin before and after getting vaccinated, that one as per their cardiologist's instructions. Please explain. I'm asking for the awareness of rest of cardio diseased patients. And I want to get this clarified if this is a myth. So uh, Dushant, you, um, you want to ask that and I'll take off of that. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, so, Every vaccine 
every drug we use, there are side effects. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, AstraZeneca, like uh, the same platform that Janssen uses, similar adenovirus vector vaccines, have this, this issue about uh, you know, the uh, low plat the platelet depletion and also blood clotting. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the incidence of our millions of doses that are given, it is extremely rare. Now, whether you take an aspirin or not, I mean, there are no studies to show this. I mean, if a medical, if a cardiologist says to take it, I think it's okay, but there are no studies to show that, you know, because it's such a rare incidence that these things happen, you can't like, uh, there, are, there is no data to support either way. So I think personal medical, I mean, your, if cardiologist says it, it's okay, if, as long as you agree. Deep, do you, do you have anything? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dushanta, yeah. Um, so now we are in a pivotal point with HIV. This year, we are kind of celebrating 40 years of HIV. We have had tons of experience with modern technology, science and technology with regard to HIV medications and HIV, the evolving story of HIV. But do we know all the answers to those? Do we even have a, a vaccine against HIV? No. Right, that's the untold truth about HIV, and there are many, many infections going back to the uh, the golden days, the measles, the mumps, rubella, chickenpox, all those things. We know there's a vaccine, but what kind of nobody has looked into specifics such as the blood clotting and so on with regard to those vaccines. You know, given the sheer number of those things, so we have failed ourselves as scientists about those things. But when it comes to COVID-19, now everybody's energized. Now everybody wants to know everything about COVID-19. I think that's part of the story. I think it's about time people start listening to the, 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 the scientists, right? Yes, there are side effects, such as the cavernous sinus thrombosis, cavernous venous sinus thrombosis that are shown by uh, by uh, the Johnson Johnson as well as AstraZeneca, but as, as Dushant alluded to, those are very, very rare. Now, can I take an aspirin, aspirin or two to prevent that? Yes, definitely. I mean, I, th I think I uh, mentioned that in my, some of my previous talks. That's actually a simple thing to do. You can actually protect yourself by doing that. But there are no studies looking into that because they're not interested in very inexpensive medications like aspirin, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Are children not vulnerable to the virus? Uh, children are vulnerable, definitely vulnerable. But they, if you look at the as a proportion that uh, the uh, who end up in ICU or mortality and uh, severe morbidity is very very low. In fact, at the beginning of the pandemic, Britain suggested what you call a challenge studies. Challenge studies means that you take people, uh, say between 18, uh, you know, young people between 25 and say 16 or 18 to 25, and you deliberately infect them with COVID. You vaccinate them and you deliberately infect them with COVID and see how quickly the response is. So this is actually, this is not a just a theory, but 30,000 people volunteer to pray, take part in it in Britain. And and so when I recently present, I presented at the beginning of the pandemic, the, this is nothing uh, dangerous because this has been done by the NIH and the Britain for, uh, for various other uh, diseases. So uh, I'm, what I'm saying is that the children are, are pretty, pretty resilient. Thank you. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Well, that was the last of our questions and we are running rather late too. Um, but thank you both for this fascinating uh, discussion today. I'm sure everyone's learned a lot and I certainly have. So thank you both for your time and your efforts. And I will now pass it on to Keshini. Thank you, Dr. Vineshi. Thank you, Dr. G.P. Jayasekara and Dr. Yushanta Jayavira. Wow, a lot to observe, very informative, but I'm kind of concerned about the booster. We all hope that we can get back to our normal lives, but <laughs> now I'm kind of afraid after what I heard, so, but we have to be safe, so. Now I would like to invite with great pleasure and honor, Mrs. Aisha Jaya Singha, the Vice President of Sri Lanka Foundation International, 
to convey the vote of thanks. Uh, and can we also have Dr. Walter Jai Singh's video on? Because previously, uh, people told me that they could see him. Uh, I got a few texts. And also, Achala, good, I'm glad you're there as well. So, Chamod, can we have Dr. Walter? Is he available to turn the video on, Aisha? Uh, he's not available right now, Keshi. Okay. Needs to... No problem. Okay, Aisha, over to you then. Aisha needs to be uh, uh, unmuted now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. That was a very, very interesting talk and uh, so much of new information and uh, things that you would really have not thought of before. It is, it is really great. I want to thank uh, our presenters and our lady who was a host uh, about Ella getting this together because I know it takes a lot of work, time and effort and energy to make that happen. And I do appreciate our two doctors that they are wonderful and they work hard and they still have time to help us and help the people to understand this disease. disease and, um, going forward, it seems like we're not going to get rid of it that easily. So this information is so vital. And I was thinking I'm going to look at the statistics again because it went so fast. But it is a very, very good presentation of what's happening new because COVID is changing and changing and changing. And new information is vital because it's, everything is not the same as it was because it's, it's a changing environment. I also want to thank the Sri Lanka Foundation staff. They have done a great job in making all these things happen. Keshani, Shirani, Chavud and everybody else involved. Um, it was so nice to have this being done like this and uh, I want to thank everyone and all the people that have worked towards getting those statistics and everything else and keeping everybody informed and circulating it and uh, also uh, uh, Slamana uh, for wanting to do this and uh, cooperating with us so uh, I want to thank everyone for you know, all the things you have done and especially the uh, pre presenters the doctors that did, that did the, uh, gave us all this information because I was really uh, fascinated by that and I'm hoping <laughs> that we won't get COVID again. So, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Arjuna. Thank, thank you to everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, and have a wonderful weekend. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.